Hello and welcome to the Tough Girl Podcast, which is all about motivating and inspiring you. I'm your host, Sarah Williams. Today, I'm delighted we're going to be speaking to Jen Bricker. Jen is an accomplished acrobat and aerialist who was born without legs. Jen is currently living in Los Angeles and her goal is to inspire and motivate others to believe that anything is truly possible. So Jen, if I was to get you to introduce yourself, how would you how would you introduce yourself? Well, the the short phrase that's on, you know, all of my social media would be author, aerialist and speaker. <laughs> that's that's the shortened version of of the titles of what I do, basically. Oh, fantastic. But we're going to be finding out a lot more about the books that you've written, the aerial work that you've done, and some of the the speaking engagements that you've done. But let's go back to the very start. So tell everybody a little bit more about what it was like growing up for you. You know, for me, as odd as maybe it sounds to people, now, now that I've spoken about my life for so many years and done so many TV interviews and, you know, written a book about my life, it's, Growing up, I didn't realize that how I was living was not normal, right, or quote, normal. Because when I think of my childhood, it, it was just a fun childhood, you know? it's I did sports. I was always climbing trees. I was like the little monkey, you know, which is so suiting for me, and um, full of love, full of adventure, and I have good memories. You know, when I think of my childhood, I just think of good memories memories and love and so much encouragement. And so it wasn't some crazy, secluded or sad kind of, you know, it it was just I had a great uh, school, great friends at school, great coaches, and good teachers. And so it was not only the support from home, in my family environment, but also extended, you know, into my peers who that's really who I do everyday life with as well. Right. And so that was very, uh, I think that's what kind of made me so, uh, passionate about community. Uh, I am a product of a powerful community and what, what pouring into somebody will do for their life, pouring love into someone, pouring, uh, confidence, support, encouragement, the list goes on and on. So my childhood was love and encouragement and adventure. Oh, fantastic. You talked about memories, all these memories, which sound incredible. Could you give an example of a memory or, you know, a moment from your childhood that sticks out? Oh, man, there's so many. Well, I think one of the, now, obviously, in retrospect now, I, I'm so impressed by my parents is like natural, just, they just knew how to raise me, period. They weren't perfect, but they knew they were the family that was supposed to raise me, hands down, no doubt. And so when I would come to them and say, just with all the confidence in the world, had no clue that it wasn't, again, normal, quote normal, I was like, oh, I want to play softball, basketball, volleyball, power tumbling, of course, regular sports in school, no special anything. And even so much so when I came and said, I want to go roller skating, (laughs) you know, I I was born without legs. And so this, you would think, wait a minute, uh, that's not even possible that you can't even do that. That that's a majority of people's automatic first response, but not my parents just period. They're just like, okay, well then we'll just put the roller skates on your hands. Like it just, it was like there's always a way to do something. There was never an automatic negative. So to me, that's, again, when I was younger, it was completely normal. I did not at all understand why anybody would think what I was doing was special. In fact, I didn't get it, and it was, like, irritating. <laughs> oh, but go ahead. Oh, now I was going to say carry on, carry on. Yeah, but, like, you know, so they just – they didn't discourage anything. And I don't, to me, discouraging isn't just an outright saying no. It is also if they would have said, well, maybe, I don't know, that's kind of dangerous. Or how are you going to do that? I mean, isn't that kind of hard? Isn't it? How will you do that? To me, that 
response is also negative and also discouraging. And they didn't do that. And I've, I didn't know to, to appreciate it or understand it as a kid because this was normal for me. I was, I was known for being an athlete, athletic, like a little acrobatic climber, which is completely fitting and suiting for me. So I never would have identified as a person with the mentality of someone who was, quote, disabled or a person without legs. Like none of that was an identity of mine my whole childhood, which I know sounds crazy now, but in real time, it was just the most normal thing in the world. Your parents just sound phenomenal. Just the, the love and support and the encouragement and the, you know, the can-do attitude. When did you find out that you were adopted? I, I've always, I feel like when I try to remember, I don't remember an age because I've just always known I remember them telling me, I mean, I was probably four or five years old. I mean, I was really young and they just explained it like, oh, you know, someone else carried you in their tummy until, you know, we were ready for you. Like, and it was just like, okay. And then moving on, you know, it just made sense to me. And it was so sweet because my mom told me her tummy was broken. And as a four or five year old, it just made all the sense in the world. And that was it. And, and they were very open as well. Like, um, they said, you know, your, your biological family was from Romania and, you know, it was a different culture, different mindset and people who have things that are different with them are really, you know, outcasts in that country. And they're thought of, they're viewed, uh, socially kind of maybe like a curse or something odd. And, so, and they also grew up under communism. And so it was just a completely different mentality. And they said, you know, they were just real with me. They're like, they probably gave you up for adoption because you didn't have legs among whatever other reasons. But, you know, they were just like, that's just how it is. And you were our answered prayer and you were supposed to be with us. So it just, they just knew that. And they're like, this is where you're supposed to be. So it worked out how it was supposed to work out. So that way I didn't, hate my biological parents. I never held bitterness toward them. It was just, I think because they were just nipped it so young and were so honest, it just deflated any chip on my shoulder that I would have had or any bit of animosity toward my biological family. And thankfully so, because that's a heavy weight to carry. Mm -hmm. And I didn't have to carry it. I mean, you, you talked about your identity and you know, growing up, sports was this huge passion of yours and you were getting involved in everything and anything and, and wanting to do it. Did, mm -hmm. that, did that identity ever change? Did, was there ever a moment where you suddenly thought, actually, maybe I shouldn't be doing what I'm doing? No, not, no, not certainly not as a kid. I was just, when I look back and think about it, it cracks me up. I mean, I really honestly did not it's like of course I knew I didn't have legs but it just didn't fully register it just, and I, I know that was on purpose like my mind was protected my whole childhood was protected like I had to grow up in that town which was literally the middle of nowhere cornfield like like when you think of the image where you see Superman where he grew up in like the middle of nowhere in cornfields that's where I grew up and it's the it's ironic because it's so unassuming, small town, simple, simple, simple. And that's exactly where I needed to be so that I could be who I am today. And as a kid, I was just living my life. I was doing the things that I wanted to do because I loved them, not because I had to prove anybody wrong, because I didn't have that. I mean, there was just I love this. So it makes sense. I'm going to do it because my parents were just like, well, if you want to do something, then you do it. Like, how bad do you want it? You put your mind to it and you do it. Like, it was just that black and white. You know, there was that mental strength in my family. Nothing to do with not having legs, just who they were and how they raised us. It's like there wasn't a lot of room for no tolerating whining or excuse making. Again, not really at all connected to not having legs. That's just how they raised all of us. I have three older brothers as well. And, um, so as a kid, I was just like athlete, athlete, outdoors, sports, movement, 
and I because I loved it, and that's just who I was just in my genes, I think. Tell me about the gymnastics because I know that you were, you became almost like obsessed with, with gymnastics. Tell me more about that. Yeah, I mean, you know, everybody across the world, a majority of people love the Olympics every four years, and we were certainly one of those families. And you know, gymnastics is always a highlighted sport, and we loved gymnastics, and I loved it. I loved it before my first Olympics that I would remember, which would have been the 96 Olympics, because I was only eight at that time. So probably six or seven years old from the beginning, I just loved it. And I actually started um, beginner tumbling classes in first grade. So I mean, I this is like even before that, I was already into it and already excited. Then I start seeing it on TV as I got a little older. And just the passion grew deeper and deeper and deeper. And I, it's funny, again, I saw gymnastics and I saw them doing everything. And I was like, oh, I'm going to go to the Olympics. Like, it just, it didn't even, I was like, yeah, I might have to maybe not do certain things on the beam because, you know, they use their legs a lot, but I could do this and that. I mean, this is, this is like seven-year-old Jen dissecting this and, but that, but not seeing it as not a possibility. That's what's as I look back, amazing, because I, nothing was ever off limits. It was like, well, yeah, we had to figure out a different way to do things. You know, like if in volleyball, I wasn't going to be the star on the net because I was tiny, but I was really good in the back where the ball dropped low and I was super fast. And then basketball was like, well, I was good at stealing the ball because I was there, you know, I was at the height. And then in softball, it was like, I was so hard. I had no strike zone. I mean, it just, so you just play to your strengths. And that's, I didn't realize, but that's what I was being trained basically just by doing my whole life was basically learning how to be creative and just figure it out. So did you, you're you're living in this, um, you know, it sounds like this, incredible family you've got your three older brothers a lot of love a lot of support you're in the middle of nowhere surrounded by these you know these cornfields and you use the word protected you know you're incredibly protective and you've got these you know even your coaches and your peers and everybody knows you what was it like for you did you move away from your small town your small village I did I did I moved away when I was 19 and I started to work I got an internship at Disney World in Orlando Florida And, um, so I moved away right after I turned 19, didn't look back living there and started working at Disney world. And it's, it's so interesting because, you know, you're interacting with thousands of people every day from all over the world because Disney world is huge. It's, it's much bigger than Disneyland. You know, there's four parks there versus out here in LA where there's only two. So everybody from all over the world comes in all different cultures, all different ways of life and viewing people. And so that was my first like reality check as far as how people may view me. Cause up until this point, I told you I was identifying as the strong athlete. I was always outgoing. I was always popular. I was always social. I was strong, you know? And then I'm getting these reactions from people that I'm just like completely blown away, confused, baffled, irritated. I mean, you know, it would be like this one older couple. And and I started noticing patterns of like who acted the most like to me ridiculous or condescending. And it was always like a generation or culture thing. So usually people like over 50 would maybe say things that could be taken as very condescending or like, did you seriously just say that? Even though I know you didn't mean it that way, right? So this older couple one time came up to me and they just like literally patted me on the back and was like, oh, it's it's so good that you're out working. And I was like, what? I, I I was so confused. And you could tell they really thought that they were being nice. Like they didn't, they didn't have some bad intention but obviously it came off extremely condescending and completely, I had to like check my attitude, you know, (laughs) and, and all these things. And I'm just, but I was so confused because I was like, wait, what? Uh, They're seeing me as like 
some helpless person. Like I was so confused. I, it took me so long after all these things kept happening. And then you have people from other countries who just, I mean, have even less tact, you know, and not that I'm, it's just a culture thing. Right. And, um, I've been to 17 countries. So like, I, I get that, you know, I learn, I know how these things work, but at the time I was only 19. So I hadn't been all over the world yet. And I was, this was my, like, it was like I was in a lab studying people and studying their reactions and then starting to figure all, basically collecting all the data without realizing it and figuring out, oh my gosh, the people actually see me this way. And wait, what? So it was a huge wake up call, sort of reality check kind of thing. And, and very interesting for me. How did you handle that wake up call? How did you almost process it? Was it, a, was it a quick journey to, for you to process it? Did it take some time? What did you learn while you were going through, through these, through these experiences when you were 19? Yeah, well, you know, I learned a lot about people, um, which has been, I mean, so cool. Cause I have now such a passion. Oh my gosh. I love traveling the world. I love different cultures. I love, you know, the different foods. And I'm, I'm so blessed that extremely blessed that I've spent, I spent my whole twenties traveling the world. I just turned 30 a week ago and I, uh, it's just incredible, you know? And so studying, I just, by nature, just I'm like, Oh, I wonder why they act that way. Right. And so I started breaking it down and realizing what I just said about the generation gap. Well, people from that generation, they were raised that all they knew of people who were in a wheelchair or whatever was such, there was such a stigma. There was such a totally different, uh, society and, and thought about it as, as now so different. And so they just didn't know any better, you know? And so it was like, I knew they didn't have like malicious intentions or anything like that, but, and then the same with different countries, it was like, well, they again are raised where you just kind of people, a lot of countries still right now, people who are different, they don't even go out in public. I mean, they're like hidden away They're It's crazy. I mean, it's, it's a hard concept for people, I think in, in the U S or the UK or, you know, Australia, places like that to grasp, but there are still those societal norms, right? So I started learning a lot about how people would react and it was, but it was a huge, I think the biggest challenge for me was to <laughs> keep my emotions together because I, it would be so irritating. Like I would get so irritated. I'm like, are you really like, you have no clue. Like you're literally telling the most physically active person this, that you have no idea my life, my, what I do, how I am. And it was, you can't explain it. Like if someone thinks I can't even open a door by myself, you can't think you can't explain to them what I do, that I'm an acrobat and aerialist and all this stuff. It's like completely over their head. They're not going to get it. So you just like, let it go. You know what I mean? And I just learned so much about people's behaviors and about, and then myself, you know, my, again, my challenge was, Jen, this is your opportunity. Cause really when I meet those people and have the inter interactions that right there in that moment, even when I'm super irritated by what they just said or how they acted, that's the teaching moment. And that has taken me years to like calm down the flame and the fire because I just have this passion and fire that rages in many beautiful ways, but it can also go in the frustration way, right? It can work kind of both ways for you. And so I've had to learn how to calm that down and just listen to people, hear them out, communicate with them, and use those moments as teaching moments and just kind of explain it. So that's the moment where their whole mind shifts like, whoa, wait a minute, what? This is not even in a realm of what I thought was possible at all. And you're telling me this or, you know, just just having a normal conversation with them or giving them a little card about my book so that they can just, you know, if they want to read it and they want to learn, they can. And so it's it's been I would say I a lot of it was a really fast chunk of learning, but so much growth and fine tuning has happened over the last 10, 11 years. Yeah. I mean, one of the things that you talked about there is, you know, giving people a card for your book. And I love the title of your book. You know, everything is possible, finding the faith mm -hmm. and courage to follow your dreams. When did you decide to write a book? 
Uh, I think it was 2014. It was put on my heart. And I knew like, I knew that God was telling me that this was the right moment because there were certain things in my life that I could talk about freely. And I knew that that had to come first before I could write a book because I wanted to be completely open, completely real, completely transparent in the book. And you can't do that if there are certain parts of your life that you don't want to talk about. And so I knew it was the right time. It was really on my heart and, and it was just definitely the right time. Were you scared of putting yourself out there, like putting, you know, writing, writing a book, telling, telling the world your story? Was there any feelings of apprehension? I think as it got closer, like once the book was sold, once we had started writing it, you know, there's so many things that happen before the book actually comes out. So once it was getting close to actually coming out, the, the funny thing is I was more angsty about my family and pe- people that I knew reading it versus people that I didn't know far more like, oh, wow, they're, this is so real. I mean, this is like this is the inside of who I am. And and so having people who know you, <laughs> I don't know, it was much harder uh, having that reality versus the, the millions of people who don't know me. Oh, I get that. I, I, yeah. I, I get that. Why, did, <laughs> why, well, how did you decide on the title, Everything is Possible? Well, I was running through different things, and I, I just was thinking, what is one w- wording or title or phrase that sums up what I believe, how I live my life, who I am? And um, I this Bible verse came into my head, everything is possible to the one who believes. And I just was like, wait a minute, everything is possible. Like just the first part of that. And I was like, wait, that's it. Because that, that's really what I believe. I mean, I, and I had been um, debating like two years prior to this, this whole time in my life about getting uh, another tattoo. I have a really beautiful art piece on the right side of my back and I was thinking, man, I kind of want to get a scripture just like in black, cursive, beautiful. What would I get? And I, I kept wanting to do everything as possible to the one who believes. But it's, it was like it was way too long. It's way too long. I don't want that much on my body, you know. And so then I was like, wait, everything is possible. Yeah, that, I really believe that. And yes, that is how I live my life. So that's perfect. And so that's just how it came about. You have actually traveled with Britney Spears on her circus tour. Tell us a little bit more about life on the road and and traveling the world. Oh, yes. It's so it's so crazy. I mean, I had just became an acrobat and an aerialist in 2008. So I just entered the entertainment world. And my first performance was mid like summer of 2008. And then my first air, that was my first trampoline performance. I had a, uh, my old partner, Nate, he and I created this amazingly technical, just super difficult trampoline act. Now, when I say trampoline, most of our minds go to these trampolines that we grew up with in our backyard that are circular and the bed of the trampoline is black. But these trampolines are rectangular, 12 by 14 feet. And you go very, very, very high. These are like $10,000 trampolines. And so one wrong move, I mean, one degree off, and you're just going to fly right off this thing. And so it's very, 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 very technical, especially when you're doing a duo, when you have two people on the on the bed. So that's what we, that was our first performance mid uh, summer of 2008. We also created a silk act, the aerial silk act so it's the silks that hang from the ceiling and you perform and you twist and you fly and you do all these things so we did both of those and that didn't happen until november of 2008 and then the next year 2009 bam i was thrown onto the highest grossing tour in the world as a featured act touring with britney spears all over north america all over australia and the 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 pressure was so intense the when i first got on the tour i would say it took me at least the first 10 shows to calm down a little bit. I mean, it was just, you know, we would enter 
we'd go out into the arena with these black cloaks. And there, I mean, thousands, thousands of people, sometimes 20,000 people in the arena where you're performing. And we had the Pussycat Dolls and Jordan Sparks all as openers, all these different amazingly talented artists as the openers of the concert. And then there would be about a 30 minute break and then the official concert would start. So we would go out and weave our way through the crowd with these black cloaks on covering up our costumes. We'd go underneath the stage and this stage was massive. I mean, it, this was a production. It was 17 semis of just equipment for the setup. That's not even counting our tour buses and her tour. I mean, just, it was insane. And so you get underneath the stage and it's like a whole life, a whole city, a whole world underneath there. Everyone's the, the wardrobe people are running around. The dancers are all stretching. The acrobats are stretching the area. You know, it's a whole city. It's like a live. And then the concert starts with this massive countdown. And I mean, it just, it rattled the state. People went nuts, you know, 10, nine, eight. And by the time one came, everyone goes nuts. Everything is shaking literally around you. And by the time we were ready, a lift would lower. It was actually, you know, the top of the stage, but we were below the stage. So it would lower down. Nate and I would jump on it. I always rubbed his head for good luck because all the guys had to shave their heads for the tour. So I'd rub his head for good luck. We would be lifted up and I was in my wheelchair on the stage because it was inc- so we I went up on my chair. We both went up. The trampoline was there and we kind of circled around separately and then met back in the front in the middle of the trampoline. He was behind me. And on the downbeat, he threw me out of the chair backwards onto the trampoline. And I did a backflip. And it was like the whole audience was. Oh, yes, like it was that there was that little pause of like, did he just what is happening and then I did a flip and then it was like, yeah. And then they just erupted in like freaking out and cheering. It was the most like incredible and intense, surreal time in my life. And it gave me, I mean, nothing is ever going to be that intimidating again. It, I mean, it was absolutely terrifying and incredible and exhilarating, but it, because it happened in the very beginning of my career, it just skyrocketed my confidence, my experience. I mean, there, I was either going to fail miserably and my career would be over before it started, or I was going to rise to, to the extreme pressure and and succeed in this this whole new career path. Because before this, I was going into fashion, so this was like a completely different, you know, career turn, and it happened so quickly. And I'm I'm so grateful for that time in my life because it just it really made me rise and such a better performer and just an immense amount of confidence from the beginning. I want to talk about the pressure, you know, because you, you talked about the pressure before you're going on, you're on this, this world stage, you're going out there, you can't make any, any mistakes, any, any errors. How did you deal with that pressure? And what did you learn by going through that experience? Man, I, I really feel like I learned a lot. I mean, I was only 21. And so I, I, it was such a, everything was new. Everything about that was new. The, the being on tour, the being on the road, not only being on tour, but being on the highest grossing tour in the world, having paparazzi follow you, having, you know, VIP access to every single place you want to go, people wanting the tickets. People, I mean, it was just insane. The whole culture of, you know, the entertainment industry, which again, was all very new for me. You know, I wasn't, I would never lived that life. And I, every time, so before every show, I would take that black cape, drape it over my head, find a quiet corner in whatever arena we were in. And I would, um, I would pray. And then I would visualize every single piece of the performance. And it would I'd probably, I'd probably be in that corner usually for 20, 30 minutes every <laughs> before. And I would just run through the act. I would pray about it for our safety and for just that we would have fun and enjoy it, you know. And, um, and of course, every performance wasn't perfect, but we had no major mishaps in 40 shows. So that, that's a pretty good streak. I will take it, you know. And, um, and just so I learned, I learned how to handle extreme pressure. I learned, I mean, and that right there translates into every part of your life. I mean, literally, 
I don't think since then there, and I don't think there ever will be, there has never been that much pressure on, especially a performance, but, um, in anything in my life, you know? And so, because as a performer, it's not if something's going to go wrong, it's when, right? So throughout my performing career, when their music was having problems or there were technical difficulties or whatever, whatever, it was like, no big deal. Like you just, it, it makes you learn how to roll with the punches and, um, how to, I mean, we commanded an audience of 20,000 people sometimes, you know, that's a, and, and so now as a speaker, I think that also has helped too, you know, when you're, and that's a totally different, it, it's a totally different field, but there are similar aspects to, to that. I mean, it's nothing for me to be in front of a crowd of 20,000 people. It's just because that was my first, my whole first experiences were large, large, large crowds where we were the only thing happening. So every eye was on us. It wasn't like it was an atmosphere performance. It was the performance. And so that pressure just was intensified. And it, you know, so you learn how to rise to the occasion, how to be calm, even when everything else around you is completely chaotic. And I think I learned how to tune out everything around me, which is an incredibly valuable skill because you can't, you know, and I learned what I needed. I learned what I needed beforehand, what would calm me down how to go into that and and also how to enjoy it. Like I didn't want to go through the whole tour and be so angsty and so worried. And then before I knew it, the tour was over. I wanted to really take it in and soak it in that very few people in their entire lives ever get to experience what I experienced. And I experienced it at such a young age and it really helped me. Um, in your book, you also you've written down a dream list. Could you just share a little bit more about the dream list and when you started writing down your dreams or your goals? Oh man, I. It's funny. I I was always very careful with those kind of things because I never wanted to set a five year plan or a ten year plan or say, oh, by thirty, I want to do X, Y, and Z. Because we can have all the plans we want. And then life happens and, and it can completely go in a 100% different direction. So I, and then you set yourself up for a disappointment rather than just accepting and enjoying and appreciating what actually comes and happens in life. So that was always a very fine line, but of course I had things still that I would love to do this. I would love to do that. I would, you know, and and then people over time just ask you, (laughs) what are your goals? What are things you want to do? You know? So it's like, Um, so I, I wrote those down because so that the, what I love about the last chapter, and it was actually my writer's idea and I thought it was brilliant. Um, just because it's who I am. Right. So it would make so much sense if you knew me that I would have, like, of course I would have a whole chapter just about things that irritate me or things that I love or things that I want to do, you know, cause I wanted to be so real with people. And, and I was in the book. And so that was really me just like, this is Jen. Like, this is who I am. This is who my heart is, what my heart is, you know? And so, um, throughout, like I said, traveling throughout all my twenties, I developed such a passion for travel. So you'll see in the book, I want to go here. I want to go there. I want to visit all the countries. I want to do all the things, you know? And I think that will always travel is one of, I say travel is my currency. So even when I married and have kids, I don't want that. That's not going to stop like that. For a lot of people, they're like, oh, Jen, well, it's good that you're traveling now because, you know, before you have kids and get married. And I'm like, please, I, I want my kids. My kids will also travel and I will marry someone who wants to travel, you know, because it's changed my life. And so a lot of my goals are always oriented around traveling because it it really changed me and opened my eyes and just made me flexible and more relaxed and so many beneficial skills, I think, just that, again, that translate through your whole life. And I still like, even I've been to 17 countries, and there's 17 more that I want to go to, you know, <laughs> and, and experience that with people that I love. So can you tell us which country stands out? So, or, you know, was there a moment traveling when something incredible happened, or something challenging happened, or something that just sticks in your memory? Oh, my gosh. It's it's hard to narrow them down, but 
as of now, so I just, um, not even a month ago, got back from uh, Austria and Prague. I, I had a speaking gig in Prague, and I flew out two weeks early as an early 30th birthday gift <laughs> to travel and vacation throughout Austria. I had friends over there that I met up with, and that country stole my heart. I mean, I 100% fell in love with Austria, the hills, the nature, the grass is literally a different shade of green. I mean, I, it <laughs> blew my mind. The people, all oh, the people are lovely and the food and it's just, I, I fell in love. I fell in love with it. I also loved Thailand. I really loved, uh, it was on one of the islands, a small island. And I had a, a gig in Malaysia. And so again, I made a whole Southeastern Asia um, vacation <laughs> for 19 days and saw Malaysia and Singapore and Thailand. But Thailand stands out. Costa Rica stands out. Um, and Tokyo. I, I, I really enjoyed Tokyo as well. And um, I'd say probably a, a really cool, challenging and incredible moment. Last year I was in Beijing and my friend and I went to the Great Wall and we literally had like a, a three hour window to get this done. So we getting there, like going up to the wall is like, you know, a hike and adventure. Then you get on the wall and it's a hike and adventure, right? I mean, this is super old structures and, and just incredible. And so it, it was like the amazing race. I mean, we, my friend and I, at one point, the, the quote ramp was, I mean, the most steep, dangerous angle. And she's like, I'm like, I'm not safe in this. I got to get out of my chair. She's like, get out, bail. (laughs) So I just get out of the chair. She pushes it and we just walk, you know, and walk up the stairs and the ramp. And then we get to the, to the great wall. And it's just like, you know, amazing. And we're, or what we just park my chair and leave it because it was useless to be in. It was like dangerous to be in my chair at this point. So I'm walking and then we go up these little towers, you know, you climb up the stairs and you get up to the viewpoint. And, and again, a culture thing, right? Like people are like taking pictures and they're like literally clapping. Like it's just hilarious. I'm over here. Like I'm surviving because this is <laughs> like, we were three hours nonstop of, walking and up and down and uneven, you know, and this and that. And, but it was so incredible, like just incredible. And one of the things that I am known for, which is why the cover of my book is me doing my overextended handstand. When I'm in a foreign country or just even in a new city, I always do. It's kind of become my signature thing is this overextended handstand that I do. And so I got epic handstand shots on the Great Wall of China. (laughs) And So it was, and then the next day I was literally hobbling like a 90 year old woman. I, I work out five, six days a week. Okay. I, it takes, it's really hard for me actually to get sore anymore. I was so sore. My butt was sore. My hands were sore. I mean, sore in places. I was like, I didn't even know I could be sore here and for like three days, but it was so good to feel that way. Cause we worked so hard and we were just, you know, it was amazing. So that was, that was a pretty unique experience. Oh, it sounds fantastic. I love it. I love when you can do like take all those incredible photos when you're in these amazing places like China. Yes. Now, you you had um you you had an idol growing up. You you know, you you obviously you're obsessed with gymnastics. You you had this idol, um, Olympic gold medalist called Dominique. Is it how do I pronounce the surname? Makono? M- Mac- uh, Mochiano. Mochiano. Um Yes. Can you tell us this that story? Yes. So, you know, earlier, like I said, I, I was drawn to gymnastics at a very young age. And then once I, you know, I was in it, I was in beginner classes from first grade. And then I see it on TV. And then I see the Olympics. And then I see Dominique. And I knew she was Romanian. And I knew I was Romanian. And I was always so proud of that fact. You know, I grew up in in the middle of nowhere, where there was pretty much no other ethnicity at all. So that I always felt exotic and I had this dark black hair and super dark skin and these big eyes. So I didn't look like anybody else in, in that regards. So then I see Dominique and she looks like me and she's Romanian. I'm like, Oh oh my gosh. I mean, that was, that was really something for me because I never had anyone to look like me. So that was just, that was incredible. And, and then I just saw similarities. I'm like, wow, 
I mean, the personality, the looks, obviously, just the mannerisms. And so I was drawn to her from probably eight years old, nine years old. What happened next? So that was, again, young, loved gymnastics, growing up, had her book, everything like that. And then I you know, competed in power tumbling for four years, went to state, won state meet one year in my division, went to junior Olympics, got fourth all around. You know, I was again. And so this is when I started being on TV a lot, I was interviewed. I was on national and international TV shows and I didn't understand. I mean, I was the first person like myself with no legs to ever compete in AAU and USTA uh, power tumbling and, and then actually being good at it. Right. But again, I didn't get it. I was just doing what I loved. I did not understand why everybody thought I was an inspiration, did not get it whatsoever. And so fast forward to uh, almost 16, right before I turned 16, my friend who was also adopted, she had found out what her biological last name was. And never until that point was I interested in trying to find my biological family or anything like that. And then bam, light bulb goes off. And I'm like, oh, I wonder what my biological last name would have been. I go home and I ask my mom if she knew anything about my biological family. Now, that right there in and of itself is great. It's just insane. My family, I like I told you before, was so open, so clear, so transparent. Why on earth would I think there was even a shred of a possibility that they would know something about my biological family that they hadn't that they wouldn't have told me already? So I just I know that God placed that in my mind to go home and ask them because it just doesn't make any sense. They're, they're, why would I even ask? Why would I think, you know? So I go home and I, I mean, I ask honestly, almost as if it were like a rhetorical question. And then she actually responds, which didn't re- didn't at all expect that, let alone her saying yes. And then I'm just like, what? Like, how how on earth could you know something about my biological family? This makes I don't even get it, you know, and she goes in and gets this huge manila envelope full of papers, stuffed out papers, and she puts it on the table. She shakes her head. She's like, you're you're never going to believe this, but your biological last name is Mochianu. And that's not exactly a common last name. I knew exactly it was a beeline straight to Dominic Mochianu is your biological sister. And I was like, wait, what? Like, what? How? This is like a movie scene. I don't, what? I mean, so my mind's going crazy on the inside. And yet, and but then everything starts falling together and piecing all at once. Like, oh, oh my gosh, that makes sense. Well, that makes sense. Well, that makes sense. Because I, I watched her. I thought we looked alike. Oh my gosh, you know. But then also you're just like shocked and you're, how can this be real? You know? And so of course, immediately I wanted to meet her and I go online and I look at her website and I see pictures of her. And then I discover I have another sister and she's younger than me and looks identical to me, like straight up like my twin. And I'm just like, Oh my God, now I have two sisters. I mean, so I'm even more motivated to meet them. And, um, But I knew that it it had to be done with finesse. It had to be, you know, you couldn't just call her up and say that. They're like, you're crazy, you know. So it was a long story short. It was a four year journey that uh, failed attempts of, you know, planning things to contact them and and then falling through. But in 2007, the very end of 2007, December, I was successful and um had gotten Dominique's address through my uncle, who was a private investigator, of course. And so um, he helped me and I sent a package, my heart basically of photos, copy of the adoption, legal documents and, um, and a carefully written letter. And um, I got a response right before Christmas from Dominique and it was a positive response. And then we all met Christina, my younger sister, me and Dominique, all met in Ohio where Dominic lives in May of 2008. So it was insane because like I just said, my career as an acrobat and an aerialist had just started that year. I just met my sisters that year. I mean, every, my whole life changed in 2008 on multiple levels. 
And so it was just, it was amazing. What a year. I mean, yeah, what a, what a year, 2008. And we met and it was just, I mean, on one hand, like surreal and insane, but on the other hand, normal and natural. And we all had the same voice and like the same foods. And I mean, it was just, you know, like twins reunited kind of things, you know, and it was, it, they were immediately my sisters, but it's been since then, which God, I can't believe we're going on 10 years. Next year will be 10 years. It's unbelievable. But it's been a growth. I mean, a journey. We it's still, you know, learning about each other. We were all, they were raised together and they were raised in a completely different environment. You know, Romanian culture, very secretive, very closed doors, um, an abusive household. And I was literally raised on the other end of the spectrum. So those things, those differences we have are directly results of our childhood, how we were raised. And so we have to work through those and figure those out and learn about each other and um, and then and then be amazed at the similarities, even though we were raised in totally opposite households, opposite households, we have unbelievable similarities. And that's just genes, you know, and DNA. It's amazing. Absolutely incredible. And I know you've written about it in, in your book, Everything is Possible, which is a New York Times bestseller. And it has been published in, I believe, nine languages, which is incredible. And the book's only been, has it only been a, around for the past year? Yes. Yep. Only a year. Wow. That is, that is phenomenal. So thank you. Where are you heading next? What's, what's, uh, what's going to be next for you? Well, um, I, so what I do now, what I'm, well, what I have been doing, I suppose, for several years is um, traveling around the world. And the reason I've been doing that is because of acrobatic and aerial performing and also uh, speaking came later in, in my life as well. So it was kind of first just the acrobatic and aerial, then the speaking got added into the mix, then the book came out. So now I do, you know, kind of this package thing. Sometimes I just speak, sometimes I just perform, but a lot of times I'll do a speech, a performance, and then book signings as well. And, um, and so it's, thankfully, that's what I, I get uh, paid to see the world, which is incredible. And next month on November 9th, I am going to New Zealand for the first time, which is super exciting. So been all over Australia, but New Zealand was very, very, very high up on my list of places that I wanted to go. And I've got a gig going there. So I'm performing um, at the Attitude Awards, which will be on TV in New Zealand. And then I'm going to take a nice vacation and explore the country that I have heard is just absolutely beautiful. So I am so excited. Oh, that is going to be incredible. New Zealand is one of my favorite countries in the world. So I know you'll have an, an amazing time. And Jen, what, what words of advice would you have for our listeners who, for people who may be going through a challenging time or, or you know, having a challenging situation or they're worried about what other people may think of them or they're scared about, you know, following their dreams? What advice would you have for them? Yeah, you know, I one of the things that I feel is so, so strongly that to communicate to people is that you know, we all have something to, you know, quote, bring to the table. We all have gifts and talents and abilities that we were born with um, on purpose and for many purposes. And they, there's, there's power in that, like the beautiful and good, pure kind of power, the power to change somebody's life. And that's not just for people who we think are inspirational and motivational. Every one of us can be an inspiration and a motivation to someone. And we all have something with our skills and our, our abilities and, and our gifts to reach somebody and to actually affect someone. But I want people to realize that they are significant and they matter and no one's talents or gifts are any more important than anybody else's. We are totally all equal and all equally have that that beautiful, pure kind of power in us to change somebody's life. But we have to believe that because it's there, whether you believe it or acknowledge it or not, it's there. So I would love for people to acknowledge that and realize that they matter, that the gifts and the desires of their hearts are there for a reason, that they are here for many reasons, and that they can affect someone's life in a positive way, no matter what. 
they just have to believe it and realize for themselves. Absolutely. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful words. Now, Jen, where would be the best place for people to go to find out more information about you, to buy your book, to find out more about your your event in New Zealand? Where should people go? Yeah, I mean, I probably in, in our culture today, you know, the best way to do is follow me on social media. So Instagram at Jen Bricker, Snapchat at Jen Bricker, Facebook, Jen Bricker. Um, that's that's the most up to date current. Of course, my website, jenbricker.com. The book is on Amazon, Barnes and Nobles, everywhere that you can uh, buy a book as well. And um, jenbricker.com hashtag or uh, slashback book. I mean, it's pretty easy to find it anywhere. Um, and to follow me, I always update where I'm going. And you can look at my stories and see where I'm at and all social media. So um, in our day and age, you know, like it's it's all about social media. I hate to say it, but it's true. So follow me on there and uh, follow my journey. Absolutely. Jen Bricker, thank you so much for coming on the Tough Girl podcast to share your story. It's been an absolute inspiration to hear you you, you share what you've been through and what you've achieved in your life. Thank you so much. Hey tribe, how are we doing? I hope you're all well and have had an amazing week, whatever it is that you have been up to. We are now in December, oh my goodness, the final month of the year, the final month of 2017, the final month to really finish off those final goals that you wanted to tick off and achieve this year. Because before you know it, we are going to be in 2018. The clock is going to strike midnight and it's going to be the 1st of January 2018. Um, But December, um, or the beginning of the month is always a very exciting time for me because I get my money in from Patreon, which honestly just makes me incredibly happy. And we've had a number of new supporters, new patrons. We're now up to 141 patrons, which is epic. I would love to reach 150 patrons by the end of the year. So if you haven't thought about becoming a patron, then please do. I received a lovely um, email from a girl who's just become a patron. And I'm just going to reach uh, read it out to you because it also links into something else that I'm changing with regards to excuse me, with regards to closing off the Tough Girl tribe to patrons only. So um, I'm not going to mention uh, mention her name, but it, it goes like this. Um, I saw your post about closing off the Tough Girl podcast to non-patrons, and it was the motivation I needed to finally get around to supporting you. I've been meaning to do it for a while, but using the excuse that I'm trying to save money for my own adventures. But I want you to know that I massively appreciate all you do and love the podcast. It's one of my goals to one day do something awesome enough to be on the podcast. So thanks for the reminder to become a patron. Thanks for all the work you do. My contribution isn't much, but I hope it helps you to keep going. Um, so obviously, absolutely amazing. I think there's just like one thing that I want to say to everybody is um, is the final line. Like my contribution isn't much, but do you know what? It really, really is. It makes such a huge difference. I cannot, uh, I sometimes feel as I'm saying it over and over again, but every little um, counts. It really does add up. Whether you are becoming a patron for a dollar a month, five dollars a month, ten dollars a month, it really, really does add up and makes a massive difference. So I just want to do a couple of shout outs to to some of my new patrons. So Sally Clements, Joanne Kelly, thank you so much for becoming my patrons in December. Massively appreciate it. Abby Fitzgibbon, you're a total legend. Thank you for increasing your pledge. That's truly awesome. Thank you, Candice Weiss, Rebecca Moritz, Cheryl Emoto, um, Ellery Smith, um, Abby, uh, yes, Abby, ah, uh, Where's the rest of them? Uh, Stephanie Cook, Evie Atkins, Ellen Rynell, Amy Henson. You guys are all absolutely fantastic. Um, Sienna Fallon. Now, I don't know if that's Shauna Fallon or Sienna. I'm going to say Sienna, S-E-A-N-N-A. Thank you so much as well for becoming a patron. Um, Thea Gordon Rawlings. Um, total, total legends. Thank you so much. It I feel as I'm repeating myself, but it makes a massive difference. So thank you so much for supporting the Tough Girl podcast. So a couple of things there that you may be thinking, oh, what is going on? What is going on? So last year in 2016, I started a closed Facebook group for the listeners of the Tough Girl podcast, and it has grown amazingly. There's now like sort of around 1,600 members. There's always people wanting to join, but it's getting to that point where it is getting, I'm personally get thinking it is getting 
too big. And once Facebook groups get too big, they lose that intimacy, they lose their connection. So from the 31st of December, the Facebook group is going to be closed. And the only new patrons or new Facebook members that will be allowed to join are new patrons. So you need to become a paid supporter of the Tough Girl podcast, which you can do through Patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com forward slash Tough Girl podcast. And you can donate $2 a month, $5 a month, whatever it is um, that you want to contribute because um, uh, it makes a huge, huge difference to funding the running costs from the, for the podcast, for my time, for the website hosting feeds, for um, for everything else that is involved in putting out content. All the content I do put out is free and it will continue to be free. But if you can contribute, it does uh, make a huge difference. Oh my God, I've said that so many times. Anyway, guys, so that is uh, one part of the news. I've already talked about Patreon as well. Um, it's going to be a final push for your 2017 goals. Also coming out this month is going to be the final episode of seven women seven challenges this will be the ending of the year so throughout the year we followed seven women from the tough girl tribe as they've gone about their life gone about living their life going after their adventures, going after their dreams. We followed them through the high points, through the low point, through the problems that they've had to overcome and solve, through massive changes through to their goals. So this will be the final episode. It's going to come out at the end of December, 31st of December, where we go back and we'll speak to the women about what they've learned about this year and what you can learn from it. I mean, the key thing from doing this was to show... Um, was to show you listening that sometimes when you go after these big dreams and goals, it's not always easy. It's not luck. It is hard work. It is dedication. It is commitment. It is focus. And actually, sometimes things go wrong. Sometimes the goalposts change. And sometimes you just have to go with the flow. So a massive, massive learning curve. It's a journey that we've all been able to share in. Truly inspiring. So make sure you hit that subscribe button. The new episode, well, new episodes of the Tough Girl podcast come out every Tuesday at 7 a.m. UK time and the seven women seven challenges episode will be coming out on the 31st of december so not long to go now until the end of the year if you're looking for some help with setting your goals then go on to toughgirlchallenges.com and search for smart goals specific measurable achievable realistic time bound so smart goals and how you can set some smart goals for 2018. I've also done a a daily podcast episode on this, so please do go check that out. And if you're not already, go and watch the vlogs from the Appalachian Trail. We are coming to the final 10 days to go now. Summit Day is going to be an epic. Flynn is editing that episode. It's going to be a long vlog, so that's on the YouTube channel, so go and check that out. Guys, have an awesome day wherever you are, whatever you are doing. Just have some fun, enjoy life, just live it to the fullest and I will be back with you next Tuesday for another awesome episode of the Tough Girl Podcast. All right, take care, lots of love, and I'll speak to you soon. Bye.